Well, today we're going to come to the last topic of all of our main topics, and that is uh, the topic of leadership development and church planting. Now, I've been repeatedly mentioning that developing your local leaders is going to be a real key to developing strong churches and reproducing churches. So that's why I want to spend some extra time on this. And uh, there's no doubt other courses on developing leaders and training people for ministry. Um, but for the terms of church planning, we're just going to have a little introduction to this topic here uh, to give you some basic ideas and some examples of what uh, I've done and others have done in their churches. So lay mobilization is going to be the key to church health and growth and reproduction. So I'm not talking about necessarily training for professional clergy. I'm not talking about a very high level of sophisticated theological training. My focus here is really on the local church, the church plant, and basically ordinary Christians, new Christians, who will be helped to learn how to serve. And that's not a replacement for uh, formal theological education. I do think that movements need leaders who are well-trained, who know the scripture, who are able to apply those scriptures to address the issues that the church is facing. But at the local level, not everybody needs that degree of training. And uh, I find this whole idea of mobilization at every level um, a very scriptural principle. If we look at Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 13, we see this spelled out very clearly. There, Paul writes, He that is God gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers. And so here we have sort of the leadership level, uh, we could say, that God has given to the church. But he tells us why he's given these leaders to the church. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, and for the building up of the body of Christ. In other words, one of the primary roles of leaders such as pastors and teachers is to equip the saints. Now, that's not some special people who have been beatified. Those are the believers. The saints is simply the Bible word for Christians, believers, ordinary believers. And so God has given these people to the church not so that they just do all the ministry themselves. Some churches are structured that way where only the formal leaders, the pastor, maybe a few elders, they're doing all the important ministry. And the weight of ministry depends on them. No, it says these people are given to the church, among other things, in fact, maybe even primarily, to equip believers, to equip the saints to do the work of service. And that, in turn, builds up the body of Christ. And the goal is described until this should happen, it should keep happening until we all attain to the unity of faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Now, isn't that what we want for strong churches? Isn't that the description of strong believers? A person who has grown so that the fullness of Christ characterizes her or his life. That's what we want to see happen. But he says the way you get there, the way from having a few leaders to having a congregation which is growing in maturity and knowledge and the fullness of Christ is this in-between role of equipping the saints. So I believe that any pastor or teacher or even evangelist or apostolic worker or prophetic worker if they are not involved in equipping ordinary Christians to do ministry, they are failing in one of the primary roles that God gave them in the church. Some pastors might say, well, I preach a good sermon every Sunday, so that, that's my equipping of the saints. And uh, I'd say, well, that's not a bad place to start, but just having a good sermon every Sunday is not really equipping people for ministry in the fullest sense. It's not helping people discover what their gifts are. It's not helping them really develop those gifts. It's not helping them find places where they can serve. Uh, it may be strengthening their faith. 
And so we need to have the kind of training that really mobilizes the entire body of Christ. So everybody, like 1 Corinthians 12 is talking about, there's people who are hands on the body, people who are feet on the body, and they are working together for the whole body. And we need all the parts active and in action and not just a few. And so that's going to be one of the keys to healthy churches. And only as we reproduce those leaders will we then have growing and reproducing churches. And so I like to say, give ministry away. As I say, some leaders like to retain ministry for themselves, especially pastors or church planners. They feel good when people say, oh, pastor, nobody can preach as good as you. And, oh, pastor, you know, you're just such a good counselor, and when I come to you, you're so wise. That makes us feel good, doesn't it? But that's not really the point. We need to give away ministry and that we train others to also be good preachers, others to be good counselors, others to be good teachers, others to be good servants in these ways, so that we're not keeping ministry to ourselves, but we're empowering and mobilizing. And so we need to transition our ministry orientation from being a primary caregiver. So in other words, I'm the pastor, I'm the church planner, I'm the main person who teaches, I'm the main person who gives care, I'm the main person who counsels. Primary caregiver, transition that to being an equipper and empowerer so that others can be primary caregivers. There's a parable that gets told about how um, there was an earthquake and, and many, many people were injured, thousands of people, the city is wiped out. And two relief teams are helicoptered in. The one relief team, the helicopter lands, doctors, nurses, they get out. Immediately people see that there's help that's arrived on the ground and they start bringing injured people. Well, they set up their tent and their, their clinic and they take the first person and the doctor says, okay, three of you start working with that person. And then the next person, okay, now three of you start working with them. Well, before long, they were all working on the injured people that were being brought to them. But there were so many more lining up waiting to be helped. And so uh, they said, well, we'll just have to work longer hours. We'll, we'll work into the night. There's so much need and so many people that are hurting and lives to be saved. And so they chose to, to work longer hours and, and um, Eventually what happened was within two weeks, this first team had become exhausted. They themselves were becoming ill. They weren't getting rest. They weren't able to, to really care for the patients anymore. So after two weeks, that team had to be sent back home again. The help stopped. But then there was the other team. Their helicopter lands. They look, they're also moved with compassion at the needs of the people. They see all these needs, but they took a different approach. This team said, we're going to send some of those people, some of our team are going to go and they're going to make sure there's a clean water supply for people. Because if people don't have clean water, they're going to get sick. And then we'll have even more people to try and care for. And then another couple of the people, he said, you know, there's so many needs here, there's no way we could treat everybody who has a need. But what we could do is we could find some of the healthy people and teach them how to, to bandage wounds and give some initial first aid. And then we can train those people and they can go out and treat all kinds of people we would never be able to treat just ourselves. And then some of his team, of course, began to take care of the patients that were in especially severe condition. That team, within a few weeks, did not burn out. Now, which one of those two relief teams was able to really help more people? The second team. Why? Because they didn't do everything themselves. They provided for preventative measures so more people didn't become sick. And they taught and mobilized others. Now, of course, that second team had decisions to make. They could say, well, there's no way we can train a professional nurse. There's no way we can train a professional doctor in just a couple of days. These people are amateurs. Can they really help people who are dying? 
Yeah, they could. They're not professionals, but they could still save lives, couldn't they? And so sometimes in ministry, it's the same way. We tend to work like that first team. There's so much to do, and especially if your church is growing and there's more people coming and more needs and more work to be done, those that initial team, they end up burning out. But if we can learn to work like the second team and mobilize others to take care of basic needs and those who are better trained to take care of the more difficult needs, we've reproduced ourselves. We've really cared for more people and we protect ourselves from burnout. And we have to make that decision, say, you know what, some of the people who we train to be small group leaders or counselors, they're not going to be professionals. They're not going to have super high level of training, but they can have enough to help people. And certainly preventative measures to help people stay healthy. So that's just a story to help you understand the logic and the importance of mobilizing others and giving away ministry as a key to church health and reproduction. TVS Seminary is a great way to invest in the kingdom of God. Please consider making a donation to support this effective educational and outreach ministry today. We exist upon your gracious giving. Please donate to support TVS Project's continuation and growth. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com.